you uh, very much, and uh, it's really an honor and a privilege for me, for me to be here as we discuss uh, critical issues uh, of energy transformation. Let me just make a few comments at the beginning uh, to, set, uh, to set a context. Uh, I think you know, one of the most important things, and maybe being very simplistic, is that we always need to recognize that there are conflicting trends. There's the need to uh, deal with climate change and to lower carbon emissions, which is obviously critical. But at the same time, uh, we have to deal with increasing demand for energy, particularly here in Asia, uh, and, and how is that going to be accomplished? And how do you balance uh, the, the need to deal with climate change with increasing energy demand? Uh, and I think that's one of the issues that's uh, uh, worth discussing uh, because uh, I think that that can create conflicts. I think we see it to some extent in Europe today. Uh, and uh, anyway, yeah, I think we have to deal with that. Obviously, gas uh, is going to be important, uh, LNG. Uh, and gives you the transition from coal, and we'll be talking uh, about that later. But we also have to, I think, work with all, the whole plethora of new technologies to determine what's really going to work uh, to achieve the goals. And I think it's really important uh, that governments be technology neutral and be willing to look at all of the uh, possible technologies that can accomplish the goal. The private sector is going to be critically important. I think that's something to talk about uh, during, during this panel. And my final point that I would make uh, in an introduction is that uh, dealing with climate change is also dealing with energy security, that they are not contradictory. Uh, and <clears throat> that as we develop new technologies and are able to rely on new technologies, that's going to lower the need to rely on individual sources of supply, uh, individual suppliers, single suppliers, and create diversity uh, and I think a much greater energy security. So having laid that out uh, at the beginning, let's, uh, let's begin the discussion. And I think our first, I'm going to turn to uh, uh, Dr. Koh, uh, Senior Minister of, Minister of State, Ministry of Trade and Industry here in Singapore. I mentioned to Dr. Koh when we were preparing a few minutes ago that his minister uh, stole a lot of his thunder <laughs> with uh, what was uh, truly an excellent, uh, excellent speech uh, earlier this morning. So let me ask Dr. Koh to comment on where you see the priorities and maybe a little bit on how you really are going to be able to implement the programs that your ministry described, what are the obstacles that you're facing, and how are you going to bring in the private sector to work on all these issues? And I would ask each panelist to be fairly brief in their comments so that we'll have time for other questions from the audience. Well, thank you for, for having me here, and of course, welcome our guests from overseas for joining us at this year's Singapore International Energy Week. Um, as we all know, I think the, the global attention towards more sustainable development and especially the cause to mitigate climate change is getting louder and louder. Singapore, of course, advocates that we should push more for the accelerating acceleration of this transformation to make sure that we meet some of these long-term challenges. But Singapore is also a city that is always transforming and changing. And the biggest question that always people ask is when you have brownfield areas that you need to to transform. How, how much of a challenge is this and how can we tackle this? Minister Chan laid out this morning some of the uh, broader uh, policy directions and some of the energy story trusts that we want to undertake. But I think one of the things that we do to try and make sure this transformation and transition is orderly and is also well considered is to first look at it in a long term perspective and taking into account infrastructure planning that has to build in a solution that is sustainable for the longer term. So, for example, uh, an area of Singapore that is earmarked for transformation is actually the Greater Southern Waterfront. It is an existing waterfront that actually now exists as part of the Port of Singapore Authority's harbour, basically a container port. But we envision this as an area that is due for rejuvenation and redevelopment in the next couple of decades. 
And there it lies the opportunity for a brownfield site like this to have a more greenfield approach to development because you're developing this area in a holistic manner over a longer time frame. And in this kind of approach, what we do is look at master, at master plan, look at infrastructure plan, and planning so that it is something that's more sustainable. And by doing this, we then catalyze some of the change that we talked about in the energy story that Minister Chan highlighted this morning. Um, obviously, in more urbanization, more development in, the, in an area like this will increase energy demand. And also at the same time, with global warming, we're going to see more energy demand for cooling needs as well. So while it offers a great fuel site for the future development, it also increases demand on us. And therefore, Minister Chan highlighted the four supply, the four switches that will meet this increased demand from the supply side. But we're also trying to do something on the demand side as well. And in some areas that we are developing right now, for example, the Congo Digital District, we're building a smarter grid system so that it helps to kind of characterize the thinking from the consumer's perspective, whether you're a business or a residential a unit, to look at how you can model your own demand to make sure that both the supply side, we have the strategy, on the demand side, we start to shape public perception as well as actions as well. But clearly, to tackle this challenge, Singapore by ourselves will not be able to deal with this on our own. I think we, we only contribute about 0.11% of global emissions. So even if we get ourselves to zero, it's not going to change uh, you know, the whole global warming situation. And clearly, we must work with our partners, which is why last year, as ASEAN chair, we advocated for ASEAN Smart Cities Network, where we bring together pilot cities, bringing six cities across the whole ASEAN, to work together on building smarter cities, implementing solutions that we can learn from each other in finding a best solution that works for us in the tropics. Uh, and this is where I think working together will help us to shape a more sustainable future. Government, industry, the public sector, and the public itself coming together to find solutions in this common destiny. I hope this will set the stage for future discussion and thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, and now I'll turn to uh, Minister Yeo, uh, Yeo Bien, Minister of Energy, Science, Technology, Environment, and Climate Change uh, in Malaysia. And you have, I think, some very distinct problems in Malaysia. You're using a lot of coal. Uh, obviously, that's going to have to change during that transition. Uh, maybe you could describe how you are looking at this process and uh, what needs to be what needs to be done in Malaysia. To accomplish the goals that we're talking about. Thank you, Excellency. I think uh, what, uh, what sets uh, the Malaysian difference is probably this energy ministry and environment ministry is at the same place. Let me just uh, put a uh, what is our perspective? In Malaysia, we have more than about 90% of the generation comes from coal and gas. And that uh, when we changed the government last year, we actually set a new target of increasing our renewable energy in our electricity generation mix from 2% to 20% by 2025, excluding large hydro above 100 megawatt. If we include that 100 megawatt, we will be at about 40% uh, by 2025. That will mean set uh, about 6.9 gigawatt more renewable energy to go. So what does that mean for Malaysia? Um, just now a lot of people are talking about decarbonisation. Let me just give you a Malaysian perspective. As, as Energy Minister, a lot of time we are not only talking about um, the, uh, the green part, we are also talking about uh, the energy problem, uh, security, affordability and sustainability. So I give you a perspective of green story in Malaysia. So we set the new target and then we put out two new policies, not, not entirely new. One, one first net energy metering, another one we put on uh, another last scale solar uh, bidding. Let me give you the last scale solar bidding examples. We set, uh, we just closed our tender of 500 megawatt uh, just a month ago. And then through the price ranking of the bidders, in the price ranking, we found out that out of, out of 500 megawatt, 365 megawatt of this bidding, the price, is actually lower than our average gas powered plant. That means this is the first time in the history of Malaysia that we get a large scale solar energy cost that is less than gas fossil fuel. I want to put a perspective into the audience that we are not only about saving the world, it's really about that it is now an affordable price, energy price, and affordable energy solution for the country. 
The other part that we do on and that engineering training, what do we do is on um, put on uh, encouraging rooftop solar. So we put on uh, renew our net energy measuring policies where it's on the one on one offset basis. Malaysia has a lot of rules. So we put on that new policies and we have a tax allowance initiative. So last year just alone that we have increased our rooftop solar uh, approved rate by three times. And what we see right now is this, is that companies, industry who put on rooftop solar, they found out that the capex expenditure and their electricity savings, the electricity savings is able to return of a payback period of three to five years after they installed this through their electricity savings, bill savings. That means again that solar power and renewable energy is not about saving the world anymore. It is about what the DG of Arena say, it is an affordable energy solution. So our role is to how do we expedite this? How do we do things quickly? I give you an example of what we do. After the energy retreat, we want to do things very quickly, accelerating transformation. So we have our first uh, rooftop solar uh, that is biggest in 2.5 me uh, megawatt of rooftop solar in just six months. For a rooftop solar, getting all the approval done and installation commercialized and launching in June. And we know that the, the one that is in the pipeline for the biggest of rooftop solar next year that is going to come online is 12 megawatt. So that is how I think a, a, a government can do is that we set up new policies, we make sure that the specifications, uh, the framework are making sense for the business. We can't make sense for business when we ask the business to pay more. We want to make sense to the business to say that this is not only helping you to make sure your carbon footprint is good in your report, sustainability report. We want to make sure that your bottom line is also covered. This also helps us two things. I uh, just uh, on our energy, not only is it affordable uh, energy solution to us, we see this as a new frontier of growth for the 7 gigawatt of new renewable energy to come, to come online by 2025. We expected there will be about 8, 8 billion US dollar of investment and above all, it's going to create more jobs, more green jobs for the, uh, for the people of Malaysia. That, I think, policy makers and we must not lose sight that energy, uh, trans, trans, energy transition is just about decarbonisation. We must set, see this as an opportunity to create more jobs. And there are a lot of studies and research uh, in, 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 uh, that is available right now on how many number of jobs that we can actually compare it one gigawatt hour of coal and gas versus one gigawatt hour of solar. Then you see it is a new jobs that we can create. So there is a lot of work opportunities, not only about reducing carbon emission, but creating jobs, uh, creating more investment opportunities, business activities for SMEs, etc. These are all opportunities available. So Malaysian perspective is really looking at the trilemma and ask ourselves, how do we make our energy mix uh, reliable, affordable, as well as sustainable for the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, now, we, now we turn to Chairman Al uh, I might say that when I was talking to talking to you beforehand, I said, well, what do we call you? We call you chair. We have a minister, we have you know, some, how do we address you? And he said, just call me engineer. He said, that's, he said, that's what you're most proud of. I might say he got his degree at the University of Arizona in Tucson, in the United States. Having said that, uh, you already gave, a, gave an excellent uh, presentation as to what's happening in the UAE developments that you're uh, taking place. And you do have some advantages. One, you have a lot of software, uh, which, uh, which certainly helps. Uh, and you have very, very ambitious plans in support of the whole of the government plan. Uh, but let me ask you, uh, what obstacles you're facing? How do you, what, is there anything standing in the way of getting all the things done that you talked about uh, in, your, in your presentation? What lessons do you have that maybe other countries uh, can work from? Uh, so, I'll, I'll ask you a comment maybe on some of this. I think we are, yes we are blessed with the sun, but also we are blessed with the leadership visionary. Seriously, 
If I sit back and I remember and how we actually, how this green field have actually grown up so much quickly to serve the people on it as the United Arab Government. And I think how the visionary leaders said, though we have the oil and gas as much as fully available under their uh, land, that actually did not stop them from going for renewables. We've actually, or they've actually set aside a capital investment on people, on knowledge, and on a human development capital. And that's basically, we've actually relied on experts worldwide. We brought in the best in the world. We brought in the best three, and we said, okay, we need now to actually learn from the rest, and learn from how they've solved their challenges. And well, we've not started from zero. So we've actually started where they've ended. Today, I'm proudly to say that UAE and Abu Dhabi have placed their name on the world of the lowest uh, ever solar panel production, where the land is heavily rich with oil and gas resources. Major international supply of oil and gas. But that did not really prevent them from being an early adaptation of renewables. We have Arena headquarters in Abu Dhabi. That by itself is a message to say we are there to become an early adaptation of renewables. We will go for the best that serve the nation. We will go for the best that serve our environment. Uh, and the numbers actually prove it. If I would say what are the challenges? Really the challenges of going quicker and faster to the adaptation of renewables. I can announce and say we're planning to always, almost insert a 2 gigawatt of solar almost every year to the system. As you've seen, in Nur Abu Dhabi we have 1.1 uh, gigawatt as a scale of uh, large scale. Today, closing the date of the bid will be a couple of weeks now from now. It is for another 2 giga of solar plant as well. This is not the end, the end of it. We're actually going toward additional tender that will be also announced. Another 1.5 or almost 2 gig uh, as well. As much as our infrastructure can handle the intermittency of the soil, we will just go for it. Now, that will knock out the use of the gas, or the clean gas actually we're using. Uh, UAE, as a federal level, committed to have 50% of their energy mix out of clean energy. So, uh, I think if I'll answer your question shortly, all the challenges that the whole world is facing are actually our challenges. And if we can jump in and learn from them, we have a green field that actually can be an early adaptation. We have the belief, we have the will, and we have the action on the ground to actually deliver our commitment to, to the whole world. <coughs> Excellent response. Uh, <coughs> one of the things you said that I do think is really important isn't said enough, is human capital. The need to have the human resources and the human capital to get the job done. And, it's, and, it, and it sounds like we're focusing very much on that as well as I'm sure you and Singapore and some of the other, some of the other countries uh, as well. Um, let me turn that uh, to Mr. Pancho, who's the Executive Vice President of the State Grid Corporation of China. Uh, Mr. Trump will be speaking in Chinese, and you will have your uh, translate machines or whatever there inside the station one Chinese to put mine on. Uh, and it would be interesting to hear your comments because China is such a huge country and has such huge needs in uh, moving from coal to other resources moving to gas, moving to new technologies, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the priorities uh, in China uh, to get all this done, and how other countries can work with you in order to accomplish this. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President.
很高兴来到新加坡参加这个活动，也非常愿意和大家在一起啊，分享中国新能源发展的一些成就。那么我刚才注意到，其他几位先生呢，女士基本上都是政府官员，我是唯一一位来自企业者。我想说，在新能源的发展过程中，离不开政府的大力推动。和企业的共同作为，我想我的主题就是这样。围绕着这个主题，我介绍一下中国的一些情况。那么，中国是世界上最大的能源生产国和能源消费国。那么，新能源的发展对中国乃至世界，我认为就是至关重要的。也正是因为此，中国政府非常重视新能源的发展。早在二零零五年吧，啊，中国也纳入立法，可再生能源的。同时呢，中国加强体制，在电力体制和政策方面实现，啊，推动新能源的发展。呃，你比如说二零零五年，啊，当时，呃，二零零二年，啊，当时中国政府颁布了这个电力体制改革。初步政策是的话，主要是放开发电车，啊，和辅助电力辅助这一方面，我们叫主动分开和长网分开这种方面环节。那么这个环节放出来以后呢，市场化以后，极大的促进了中国电力新能源的发展。那么当时呢，我记得中国的电力总装机啊，不过三亿多千瓦，那么短短的十几年过去了。到去年年底，中国的总装机已经突破呃十九亿千瓦。呃，我记得当时的我们的供电啊，可能只有一百多亩千瓦，啊，我们的光伏几乎为零。<笑>那么现在呢，中国发展，我想后面给大家分享这个成就。呃，特别是在二零一五年，啊，中国又进一步对电力体制进行改革。啊，这一轮电力体制改革呢，主要是。放开配售这个环节，就是核定这个电网企业的收费电价机制，那么对整个交易机构，让它市场化的独立运作，对发用电权也采取放开这个方式，这一块呢，极大的促进了整个中国电力发展。那么配售放开以后呢，到今天吧。中国的在我们国家电网里区域内，啊，售电公司已经达到四千多家，配电公司也达到啊四百零四，四百多，就是极大的促进了电力消费。那么整个改革和我们立法后的成果呢，使我们中国的清洁能源，整个电力发展，啊，尤其是新能源，我说清洁能源里的发展。飞速。那么去年年底呢，中国的水电装机已经达到三亿五千瓦。那么中国的风电已经达到一点八四亿千瓦。那么中国的光伏已经已经达到了一点七亿千瓦。这个数目是非常可观的。水电、光伏和风电加起来，基本上和水电。发电相关，那么这一块呢，再加上核电，整个清洁能源发电比重占到了中国整个发电比重的百分之四十。我想这个成就是非常巨大的。啊，通过中国清洁能源的发展，啊，我们现在实现了应该说两个下降，啊，和两个上两个上升提升吧，啊，两个下降，一个就是。这个单位 GDP 能耗下降到零点五二，就是每标呃每万元标准为零点五二吨。这个数据呢，对世界上来说，特别发达国家来说，可能并不是很先进，但是呢，对中国历史的发展来看，降幅度是非常大。第二个呢，就是煤电消耗量。首次降到百分之六十以下
。那么我们提升了呢，啊，一个就是化石、非化石文明，把这这样的化石文明，我们基本上把它能够提升提升到呃百分之十四点十四点三。那么一次能源占二次能源占整个能源比重能够达到百分之二十，所以我们感觉到这是中国能源发展转型的一个核心的成就。这是主要是从政府层面做的一些工作。那么从企业方面做的工作，中国国家电网公司啊，这些年来啊，围绕着新能源的利用。围绕着为全国、整个中国经济社会发展，啊，我们也做了很多工作。我们秉承一个理念，啊，就是为了大力发展新能源，啊，要以电代煤，以电代油，啊，电从远方来，来的就是清洁电，这么一个思路发展战略，围绕着我们工作开展。所以，中国这些年呢，一直在发展制造业。大家知道，我们的自动化技术已经是非常成熟的。在中国国内，目前自动化的发展已经建成了十八十八项重大项目。啊，这里面呢有八条是交流项，就是一千千户的呃自动化交流项，有十条是直流项目，政府八百及政府一千一百啊这样。特别可惜的是，今年呢，我们正式投建了由在中国的新疆到中国的安徽啊两个地方，叫昌吉县，长达三千三百公里的，政府一千一百千户的，一一千一百千瓦这个千户的特高压线路，可以说特高压的发展，极大的促进了中国能源分布。变化啊，尤其是新能源的消耗。呃，我想呢，在座的各位可能都比较了解，我们中国能源的禀赋呢，啊，因为中国确实非常大啊，它的百分之七十的风电，主要是集中在中国的三北地区，啊，就是中国的华北、东北和中国的西北。那么，中国的光伏资源、太阳能电网资源。百分之六十主要集中在中国的西部，啊，新疆、青海、甘肃。那么中国的水电，百分之七十的比重集中在中国的西南地区，而中国的能源消费是最集中的地区，负荷最大的地方是集中在中国的中东部地区，啊，大概是百分之七十。所以这样一种资源的流过和这样一种。能源消费形式需要我们不断的发展特别这样，所以这几年呢，中国的国家电网在推动特高压的技术发展上，啊，在推动整个中国的电网建设，它也是非常快。特别是我想给大家推荐一下，就是今年我们实现了啊，中国西部的一个大厦——青海省。青海省号称是中华水产。也称为是亚洲的水产，那个那个地方的清洁发展至关重要啊，对我们亚洲是非常重要。那么今年我们尝试着在十五天、半个月的时间里，三百六十个小时，完全用清洁发电来替代整个的能源、整个的电力供应啊，这是一种非常可喜的尝试。啊，我想随着中国整个新能源的发展啊，我们不只会迈出更大。我想先介绍这些。Thank you very much, Mr. And uh, that's a very, very impressive of you. Uh, let me turn now to uh, Martin Houston, who is the Executive Vice President, right? Second vice chair. I don't see. I'm winging it. I don't have my notes in front. Second vice chair of Toronto, and to talk some about gas. Uh, and you know, gas does is somewhat controversial. 
not so much in Asia, but more, more in other places. Now you hear a lot of talk in Europe and maybe in some, maybe in some other places that oh, we shouldn't be building any gas infrastructure because you know, we can't end up a lot on that in the future. We need to do all these, all these other things. Uh, I don't agree with that, just for the record, I think that's going to be critically important. But how, how do you answer that? And how do you uh, answer the question as to whether gas can be competitive? Uh, and uh, uh, how important do you see gas uh, in this part of the world for our world? Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Richard. So, look, I feel like this morning we've had a, you know, a barrage of um, renewable facts and uh, figures and competitiveness and uh, ambitions, you know, all of which, let me just say, from the in industry's perspective, and I'm speaking from the heart of the oil and gas industry, you know, we fully support. As an industry, we have a moral obligation to do whatever we can to make sure this transition happens effectively, cost-effectively, and in a timely manner. And so you won't hear me denying or naysaying, you will hear me looking for um, the right balance between the use of hydrocarbons and the introduction of the tools which will take us to the low carbon economy, which brings us on to gas. So, you know, we, we know the, the benefits of gas. And as, uh, as Ambassador Morningstar has just said, uh, just to jump to the end of what I was going to say, we have this perversity uh, which has been uh, proposed by some of the ANSIs right now, which says we can't invest in long-term gas infrastructure because it is long-term. Therefore, we should continue with something which is unsatisfactory coal, um, and continue with that because we can push it off uh, as, soon as, um, as soon as we want. So we have this perverse, almost Faustian bargain between coal and renewables, when of course what we should have is a partnership between gas and renewables taking us to the uh, low carbon economy that everybody's talking about and we all want, we share the same goal. Look, we know the benefits of gas, I'm not going to stand here uh, and uh, outline for you. Uh, carbon reduction compared to coal, 50% um, or there or thereabouts. But you know, let me just tackle some of the, the issues that we're facing um, as we try to provide uh, this sort of partnership element to um, what I, you know, I truly believe now are com competitive uh, renewable solutions, but that they are uh, interruptible, and we have to have a firm spread, a firm spread being in always dispatchable megawatts under all conditions, no, no sun, no wind and so on. So we have to have the backing. But making the case uh, for gas, we have to be careful that we don't, in this lunar you know, 50th uh, year anniversary, we don't jettison the rockets too soon and put ourselves in a position where we don't have the very thing which underpins humankind today and God is where we are today, which is energy uh, in all of its glorious uh, forms. The skeptics today um, are many and various, and increasingly the narrative uh, moves against my industry. You know, it's estimated that potentially 90% of available capital is no longer available to the hydrocarbon industry anymore. Now, I think that's a problem. You know, it may be celebratory as far as the renewable industry is concerned, but do not forget that it is hydrocarbons that are driving the global economy today and will continue to do so for many decades to come in some part. So we have to be responsible about the narrative that we use against the industry as much as the industry has got to be responsible with its narrative about the contribution that it will continue uh, to make in the, uh, in the uh, low carbon economy. So I just want to say a couple more things, Richard, if I may. We have a responsibility to reduce carbon in everything we do, and particularly in uh, methane emissions, which are one of the things that bedevil our industry, because we're perhaps not as honest as we should be about tackling fugitive emissions in the chain. 
Secondly, biological and uh, carbon capture through geological measures is a crucial role we continue to have to play using the engineering skills of the industry to deliver that. Um, carbon pricing, we have to get behind carbon pricing and work together on the basis of the polluter pays. I mean, if we have a fundamental agreement around carbon pricing on a global basis in whatever localised solutions, we will move it forward yeah, a lot quicker. So look, I'm going to stop there um, to keep it brief, but that's the, the view from the industry, Richard, uh, uh, if I may. Thank, thank you very much, Mark. And I, think, I think the points that you made at the end are particularly important. Is there's no necessary conflict between oil and gas companies and reducing, uh, reducing emissions and dealing with climate change issues. The areas that you just outlined, the last three or four points, and others, which many energy companies are committed to, uh, will make, will have, make a serious event uh, into the problem. Not 100 percent, but would be extremely helpful. I think that certainly in the United States, I think the energy companies, uh, I love the government kind of finance or whatever, uh, but the, uh, <clears throat> the, the energy companies in the United States are in fact far ahead of this administration uh, in, uh, in dealing with these issues. I have in front of me this huge clock which has a giant numbers. We are now at 14 minutes and 20 seconds and counting down. So I have a whole bunch of questions that I could ask and will if we don't get sufficient audience participation. But given that we only have 14 minutes left, let's go to the audience and we'd like to hear your questions. And I think that I don't know how this is going to go. I see a hand back there. Uh, I'll leave it to the officials of the audience to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, take care of that. I would ask people to uh, stand up and to identify yourself. And Corey from IAGS. This is a question I just I saw see from two questions actually. First of all, how uh, heavy are the domestic subsidies for oil products? How much do they impact demand? And how difficult is it in terms of social stability to reduce them? And second question, if we look at the attack a month ago on uh, Ankhaik and other facilities in Saudi Arabia, how concerned is UAE about such attacks on uh, energy infrastructure? And how does that impact your thinking about nuclear safety going forward? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think the hydrocarbon demand worldwide will be always increasing. And I echo on the gas as well. And the, that source of energy will be always there to do the transitions toward a more safer, more cleaner energy uh, as well. So having security of such uh, assets, I think it's an interest of all, the whole nation and the whole world actually, to uh, make sure that we are protecting the engine that keeps us all as li living on this earth is actually uh, running a day-to-day -day operation. Uh, with regard to the subsidies, uh, the oil product and gas within the domestic are not being subsidized. Uh, they're actually being used, as I said earlier, to be to help the transitions toward renewable, to help the movement toward having more cleaner, uh, more sustainable uh, energy type of source. Uh, at the same time, we only, if I can call it carbohydrate, we actually use on the energy sector. It's all about clean gas. And you know how much the gas is cleaner compared to the other carbon uh, sources that we're using to, uh, on electricity. Um, and we shall still love to actually adapt the best technology worldwide to adapt uh, such renewable uh, solutions. You know, we have this screen in front of us, and I think I was told that the questions on the screen are ones from the audience that we should, that I should ask. So I will. Uh, the question that I'm looking at right now says, among sustainability, affordability, and reliability, which ones should be prioritized in the energy transformation over the 
next five years, I might, I guess I'm not going to try to answer this because I'm going to moderate it, but I don't know that they're mutually exclusive, but uh, I'll let any of the panelists who'd like to respond to do so. I may mean, I mean both. I think affordability is coming by default because you can see how much competition to drive the economic uh, of renewables um, and that become as strong as our desire to save on the environment. Uh, I think what we need to work on and heavily and expedite this is actually how much reliable is the system from infrastructure point of view and what we can use as other alternatives to bridge over any interruptions such as gas. Well, I'll say you can't really divorce all three from each other. It's a big one because you have to find the sweet spot. Uh, and it's probably best to be greedy and have all three. But the only, the only thing is to figure out how to achieve the right balance. And my suspicion is all about getting the energy mix correct for your own situation domestically. How do you get the right mix to price everything in a way that is affordable but still retain some reliability? making sure that you begin the journey of sustainability. And some of it can be policy driven. How do you price the market? How do you make the market competitive? And so the policy must come necessarily with the solution uh, to invest with the technology to strike the price balance. As energy minister, it's always uh, uh, a challenge for us uh, to what would be the priority. And uh, we always talk about getting a balance, like what Dr. Koh has said, getting a balance between uh, reliability or what we call energy security uh, sustainability and affordability. But what I would think about from a developing country perspective, first we must have an access to electricity and reliable access to electricity. Then we talk about the economic case of being sustainable and being green. And uh, being green and being affordable. Uh, so we must know that the SDG goal. UN SDG always talk about and when it talks about energy, it talks about clean and affordable energy. Uh, there are a lot, like for, for, for example, Malaysian case, there are a lot of cases where we can have been win of, of energy, uh, of uh, sustainability, as well as of, of affordability. Uh, for example, energy efficiency. We didn't have time to talk about energy efficiency, but I think Singapore case as well, on how we actually can go into um, energy efficiency, save the money, as well as save the, uh, having a, a more reliable and and sustainable energy solution. I think uh, there are a lot of uh, balance that we can take. Uh, for us, as a policy makers, as a government, is to what kind of lowest hanging fruits and what kind of most optimal solution and next step, next possible steps. What will be the most um, uh, how ideal possible steps for us is to find the one that will be giving us all three, if possible. Yeah. I think it is really important to emphasize that these three points, sustainability, reliability, affordability, can't be separated. And it goes back to that balance issue that I talked about at the beginning. In order to achieve reducing emissions, we need to have sustainability. But to satisfy increasing energy demand, we have to have affordability and reliability. And so we have to just always keep all three in mind. Okay, we have another question here. I'm gonna, uh, okay, let me get the question in the audience, then I'll get the question on the screen. Good morning. Good morning, Excellencies. I'm Ron Han from Singapore. We are in, in the environment industry for reducing emissions and substituting toxic agriculture. My question is to Her Excellency, the Minister, Ms. Yeo from Malaysia. Malaysia is one of the biggest uh, arm oil grower. Are you prepared to ban the use of toxic fertilizer for all your competition? I thank you. This is uh, the question for the uh, environment minister instead of energy minister. As far as I remember, I'm in uh, Singapore International Energy. But let me be brief on that. Uh, I think uh, we have never uh, agreed on toxic uh, fertilizers for, for uh, any of our agriculture. Plantations. On the DOE point of view, it depends on our soil quality, so we test on the soil quality of whether or not the fertilizer is actually uh, toxic or not. So, so all of the people must be complying to the environmental law, otherwise they will be punished by the law. Okay, I'm going to look at the question on the screen here. 
Do you think a major infrastructure overhaul of the electricity system is needed or inevitable in the near future? And maybe be a little more specific. How, how, how will you say that the electricity system needs to be overhauled to get electricity to all of the citizens of the countries in the region? Um, I think uh, it is impossible to do a infra over a major infrastructure overhaul for a simple reason that there are a lot of some costs uh, with our our grid and uh, with our uh, grid as well as uh, transmission and distribution lines. What we can is the future electrification. Do we want to have distributed generation? How how far do we want to go for distributed generation and therefore to decentralization? Another trend of the 3D is. Uh, decarbonization, we talked a lot about digitalization, but we rarely talk about decentralization. So in the future, what you want to electrify the further more, uh, more of consumers or bringing the current consumers is how do we decentralize electricity generation? There is no need to me in the in Malaysian perspective for a major infrastructure of the home. But moving forward to the future, how do we make it more distributed generation? I think that would be uh, Malaysian uh, future. So the changes may not be uh, may not be so uh, earth shattering like changing a whole entire grid system. You could just make it smarter by putting in sensors, putting in smarter meters. That alone will shape the demand kind of uh, from the consumers. But what about also the importance of what the minister was saying about decentralized uh, decentralized grids? What's the importance in Asia? And I realize it's different for different countries of micro grids. How you power microgrids, whether it's through renewables or renewable, just through renewables. Is there a future for, for example, small modular nuclear reactors uh, that can be put in, you know, okay. in a small way in various places? Uh, any comments from any of you further on that? Well, well, just on nuclear. I mean, look, I think nuclear is the, you know, is, is the forbidden fruit that actually is really an enormous panacea. Uh, you know, if we could adopt uh, a, a nuclear policy in some areas of the world, we would, you know, or stop outlawing it, we would certainly uh, solve many of our problems in one go. So the notion of micro-nuclear, I'm not sure, again, gets away from that, uh, from that ethos. Um, look, in terms of distributed generation, I was struck by Mr. Chan's presentation this morning and just how effective that's become already in, uh, in, in Singapore. It's absolutely as you know, uh, professor, the, um, this is what we have. Then what we have to move towards: uh, solutions, uh, small solutions for you know for small applications. It is incremental. It's not so. Uh, it's not a revolution. I believe uh, an investment that need to have focus beyond the meter business and uh, looking at the uh, behavior of the customers and looking at how can those customers uh, can be served better and more efficient. And this is the future of, I think, what uh, need to happen from smart meters to uh, awareness program and so forth. Uh, I have some questions on the screen, but I, I don't see, well, I see, well, you've already asked a question, so let me ask a question on the screen first. Okay, we have a question, question over there. I'm with the Natural Resource Program as the Commonwealth Secretary. So a lot of the countries that we support and advise in the Commonwealth are developing countries and they're facing a challenge of financing new projects in the extractive sector. So I think my question is directed to Mr. Houston from Tularian with um, a lot of multilaterals pulling financing for new oil and gas projects. Um, it'd be interesting to hear where you think um, countries like the ones that we support should be looking to for financing for new projects. A lot of the narrative we hear now is about stranded assets and this downplaying investment in the sector. It's what we hear when we are um, supporting these countries to develop their resources. And there's a lot of uncertainty around where the industry is going in the mid to long term. I think that's a very, very good question. It plays into the, uh, the flight of capital that I was talking about in the sector. I mean, the MLAs are uh, in, in part moving away as well. It's a big problem. I mean, I don't have a solution for you other than 
when we get to a certain tipping point, the problem will have to be fixed. You know, because we're only going to tackle fuel poverty uh, in some of these developing nations if we can extract the indigenous resources. It, it's, it's fine for us to sit here and pronounce a renewable strategy for a developing economy that can't afford anything. You know, affordability is a key issue here. So, you know, I think that the, to keep it brief, and the uh, the clock is ticking down quickly here. Um, the, you know, it is a problem that needs addressing. But it, my sense is we're going to get worse before we get better because it will be the next problem when we don't have the base load generation, the solution to long-term fuel poverty, which is not really being talked about today, which is a global issue particularly in two of the large economies, but most certainly in, in, in many of the former Commonwealth countries. So, look, a problem that he's fixing, and it certainly needs addressing, a very timely uh, and uh, good intervention. Thank you. Yeah. Let, me, uh, let me back that up, I guess we have a lot of time, but I did follow what you said. Yeah, you know, I, I feel as strong as anybody about lower emissions, but the idea of not financing gas infrastructure given the importance the gas is going to have over the next 20, 30, 50 years, is a plain dump. Uh, you know, I'll just put it, I'll just put it as simply as that. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be careful about it. And we shouldn't do it under the best environmental conditions, the only projects that really make sense from a, from a future standpoint. But to say there should be no financing of gas infrastructure really is, I think, going to be on. We've run out of time, uh, and uh, so I wish we did have more time for more questions. I know there are a bunch of them on the screen, but uh, uh, maybe I'll ask each of the panelists for any last comments that they would like to make. Uh, I think my just last comment, uh, following the question that was, how those project on diversification that actually been financed in uh, UAE? Uh, uh, the model that we are adopting in UAE is a single buyer. So we announced a competitive bid for developers to come and actually bid uh, a project for us. So they secure the finance, they secure the know-how and technology that actually open. All we need to define is just maybe, uh, let's say, a solar so that technology is open technology. And then the finance is being granted with those financial institutes. And I'll tell you also that the bid, the always the winning bid, will actually secure a better finance uh, solution. Well, but my, my last comment would be on trying to make uh, infrastructure projects uh, possible for financing in Asia, whether it is increasing. Last year at this forum, I did share that we have an Infrastructure Asia office set up here in Singapore, uh, capitalizing on the presence of many multilateral um, banks here in Singapore, as well as our status as a regional global financial hub. So one of the challenges about infrastructure financing is that you need to make sure the project is bankable. And energy projects can actually generate returns if you structure the project well, so that the project can pay for itself over a longer period. So Infrastructure Asia Office brings together ecosystem players from technology solution providers, infrastructure players, uh, multilateral development banks, people with the, with the financial means, as well as working with relevant government agencies to structure a project on the specific needs of the region to make sure that this bankable project will bring infrastructure to the much needed region in a sustainable way. So, something for our colleagues here and our friends here to consider. I think there are three things, that, three wins that Malaysia, right, as we formulate our energy policy, three things. Uh, we must have three wins. First, the investors and the power players must win. The first thing, the people must be able to invest, they must we have a bankable project. Therefore, whatever projects, uh, infrastructure projects will come as we bankable. And what will be the incentives that will be given to stir, uh, to, to incentivize this kind of growth? Uh, in Malaysian cases, we have green investment tax allowance, we have green income tax exemption, we have green technology financing scheme. Now we are monetizing our renewable energy through our renewable energy certificates, we have green energy trainings, um, green riders. Uh, so now, if you are RE100 companies, you can be actually RE100 in Malaysia next year to come. So how do we make sure that the energy players, the players, the business, uh, the investors win? The second is to how we make sure that the consumers win. So consumer, in terms of consumer choice, decentralizing, empowering, and this, uh, making sure that consumers have more choice and more uh, becoming a, a consumers, etc. So how consumer will win? Eventually, 
is how the government actually, or how the environment, in terms of environment, creating more jobs, having more uh, business activities. So we want to strive to make sure that we have a win for the business and investors, we have a win for the consumers, as well as government gets to achieve creating jobs, growth, as well as preserving the environment as well. So it's a win, win, win for three uh, of these stakeholders. Look, balance, um, cooperation, sensible narrative, uh, you know, these are the thematics for me. And uh, Ambassador, thank you very much for uh, chairing the session. Thank you to this outstanding panel. Really, I think this has been uh, this has been a great session, and I would uh, ask you all to uh, call the panel for the wonderful.